Welcome to Choose the Nickel. I am your host, George Bailey. My co-founder and technical support is the ever-talented, ever-beautiful Christina Bailey. This podcast is about giving kids financial freedom. My wife and I love our four children and want to learn to prepare them more effectively for the adult world. So we're interviewing fascinating people for their insights about how children learn to be financially savvy. Our guests come from diverse, sometimes conflicting schools of thought, and we love the opportunity to learn from them. We encourage listeners everywhere to weigh our guests' ideas on how best to cultivate in children a healthy relationship with money. We invite you to visit our blog at www.choosethenickel.com, subscribe to our newsletter, and explore our efforts to apply what we are learning on the podcast. Our next guest is Betsy Heller-Cohen. Betsy is Executive Director for the Regional Immigration and Innovation Initiative, the St. Louis Mosaic Project. Her past work experience includes working as a Vice President at Nestle Purina. Betsy is on the Board of Directors for Welcoming America, a national immigration integration program. She is on the Advisory Board of the St. Louis University Cook School of Business, the St. Louis Crisis Nursery Advisory Board, and the Washington University Council for Sustainability. She has spoken at the U.S. Chamber in Washington, D.C. twice on immigration, Betsy received her BA from Wellesley College and MBA from the Harvard Business School. She's as impressive a person as you will ever meet, and I loved learning more about her. Ladies and gentlemen, Betsy Cohen. Hello, Betsy Cohen. How are you doing? Welcome to the show. Welcome. Currently, you are the executive director for the St. Louis Mosaic Project. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means? It means that we have an initiative in the region to attract and retain more foreign-born people because those people that are born in the United States and that live in St. Louis are a declining number, and we need to be a growing region. And so that is why the St. Louis Economic Development Partnership and private donors funded this role, and now there are two of us that work on attracting and retaining foreign-born people. And our goal is that by the year 2020, St. Louis would be the fastest growing major metropolitan area for foreign born people. And as part of that, the last two years, we've either been number one or number two in being the fastest growing major metropolitan area for foreign born, even though we as a region only have a small number of foreign born people compared to many other regions that you might travel to. We have less than 5% and the national average is 13%. Chicago's 22%. So we have some growing to do to become a more multicultural community. Do you feel the pressure once you've got up that high in in first and second place? Yes, but I think we have hundreds of partners that are working with us for uh, motivating immigrant entrepreneurship and helping international students stay and corporations that are calling literally two per week saying how to be more welcoming and attract foreign born employees or serve the foreign born community because really they're not enough native born workers in our region. We have really about 3% unemployment. So we need foreign-born people to fill jobs, to fill STEM jobs, to fill hospitality jobs, and we need foreign-born people to be entrepreneurs and create jobs. And most of our companies uh, want customers, and they can't grow if our region isn't growing, so they want to figure out how do they grow with some of the new foreign-born consumers in the market that could be Hispanic or Asian or Mideastern. So people need to grow. The region needs to grow. Well, you and I both love St. Louis, and I'll tell the listener in full disclosure that we've actually worked together. We live here in St. Louis. I think it's a beautiful city. So the Mosaic Project really is all about economic growth. It's not just about immigration. That's the bigger vision is growing this place, making it work. Uh, What gives you such a big passion for St. Louis? My family's lived in St. Louis a long time. Um, I wasn't born here, but I've had family here, and I've lived here a long time. And I think that it is really a great place to work, live, play, and it's very economical to live here, and you can be many other places around the country uh, in easy access, and uh, I like that. I've got family members all over the country, and uh, next weekend I go to New York, and the following weekend I go to Los Angeles, and it's very central, which suits me very well. You know, Have you ever had a hard time attracting your family to St. Louis to get them to visit you here? I I have family who live all over the United States and, you know, I I go out and I visit them. Maybe it's the uh, dynamic. I'm the youngest, so I'm expected to go out to them. But uh, what has been your experience in attracting your family here? Um, Actually, people like coming here, family, friends. uh, They do like coming here. And usually I try to highlight one of the new attractions 
whether it's the new National Blues Museum or the opening of the new Arch Grounds. And I try to focus on something that's new they haven't seen before. And I say, you know, when you come, we'll do this, which is new. And so they like to see what's new. It helps, of course, that you've been very engaged in the community. You know it well. Uh, I've noticed that outside of the Mosaic Project, you also sit on the board of directors for Welcoming America. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Welcoming America is a national organization that has members around the United States and now internationally that are regions like ours that are looking to be more welcoming to foreign-born people. And I have been involved with Welcoming America for the St. Louis region, and I've been part of a leadership cohort with other regions that have collaborated to share best practices, and they needed one of the national cohort leaders to move up and be on the national board. And I raised my hand and thought that, again, it would help me elevate St. Louis on a national level. And I would also learn more and have a bigger vision if I was interacting with some people at a national level and can bring those ideas to elevate St. Louis. Well, when we're talking about a national level, you have been to the U.S. Chamber in Washington, D.C. two times. And I know that you've also been to the White House. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I think there has been such interest in immigration and all the positives and concerns about immigration. And the opportunities uh, in the last administration were uh, very much uh, encouraging and more open toward all kinds of immigration. So I was involved with a meeting at the White House when I had nominated Anna Crossland, who's the CEO of our International Institute, to be honored as one of the heroes of change for her work with refugees and immigration. And I got to be at the White House for that in one of their uh, meeting areas, which was terrific. Um, as well as our U.S. Chamber for Economic Development, they have held meetings about the positive implications of immigration. And the U.S. Chamber, like our St. Louis Regional Chamber, are big proponents that as a region and as a nation, we need people, we need workers, we need growth. And so the U.S. Chamber has convened meetings, and I have been speaker panelist twice. They have flown me to Washington to represent what a, a region like St. Louis, why in the Midwest would it matter to us, and what does a uh, a St. Louis region gain by attracting foreign-born people to add to the talent and the skills of our local population. You've also been flown to Germany as well to check out the refugee situation there? Yes, there was State Department and German um, monies that were available for German leaders who have taken in a million refugees and migrants to come to the United States to different regions and learn how we handle things different, but they wanted to learn. And as part of that, we had an opportunity to go to Germany and, and go to several cities that are both welcoming and hostile to migrants and to Berlin and learn some of the things that they have dealt with on a much larger scale. And it gave us ideas for the St. Louis region about uh, new opportunities with some housing alliances. We also saw in Germany that they have used arts and culture and music to bring the local population together in a positive way with their migrant newcomers and we have now implemented that in St. Louis on several occasions to bring people together so that people share experiences and that bonds people more quickly when they share common experiences. And that's a learning we brought back from the four of us that went to Germany last year. Well, we thank you for your service for the St. Louis community. I find it very telling that you are not a St. Louisan. Uh, natively and that you've thrown yourself headlong into this great work. I feel the same attachment. I come from California. Uh, where did you grow up? I was born in Chicago, moved to Kansas City, moved to Dallas, moved back to Chicago, moved to New York. And then I moved to St. Louis when I was 10, when my father passed away. And my mom was a widow with three children. And my mom and my dad were both from St. Louis. And in fact, um, our legacy ancestors came to St. Louis about 1850. Um, and so when my dad died and my mom was a single mom raising three children, she brought us to St. Louis where we had family and friends. And, you know, that's where I became um, um, a middle school student and started on my pathway of education and learning and, and understanding what it would take and watching my mom be a single mom and what that meant for her um, ability to be a good parent as well as to be in the workforce and motivating me. It sounds like that experience of being raised by a single parent and losing your father was a formative experience in shaping you today um, in a very positive manner. In fact, I think it, you know, it looks like you've done some amazing things. Can you describe that a little bit more? 
what that meant to you to, you said you observed your mom. How did that impact you later on? Well, my father had been a rising corporate executive. And later when I joined corporate America, in some ways, I really felt that I was fulfilling some of his destiny since his life was cut short at 38 by illness. Um, but in watching my mom, she worked hard um, with various work and jobs. She went back and got her master's when she was working. And uh, she was a wonderful role model and continues to be for what a working mother can do to be the one best parent she could be. And also to have the ability to be a worker and to be a woman in the workforce at that time that there weren't as many. And I saw what it meant to be a working mother um, as both an employee and as a mother. That's amazing to me. You know, you had this experience to see your mom as a role model. Tell me a little bit more about that. What was her general attitude? And do you have any specific experiences watching your mom and feeling like, that's what I want to do? I love that. I embrace that. Well, what I saw was that, you know, life isn't always fair. You have to be prepared to take care of yourself and your children. And you can think that life is going to work out a way you planned, but it didn't work out the way she planned. And and actually, my mother-in-law, similarly, uh, had lost her husband. And my husband uh, had lost his dad, and she had went back to work. And so, you know, you see that women um, have to be prepared to take care of themselves, whether you're striving to do it because it's your personal ambition or whether you just know you need to embrace it to care for your family and your own goals that you need to be prepared. And I saw that in her. And I saw that in the work that she did. And I also saw some of her frustrations that she worked for a company that didn't have a pension fund and uh, a pension. And, and she often said to me, you know, if she had had a different role in a different company, she would have saved more money and had some other benefits. And that was something that I had my eye out for when I then joined the workforce to look for a company that offered um, pension benefits, that had good security, that had benefits. And I saw the importance that the long term financial security would make. And I think that her experience um, of wanting security for herself and for us meant a lot. We also, we lived a good life, but we also didn't have some of the luxuries that we would have had had my father lived. And I think um, while we had a very good life, there were things we just didn't have. We had allowances, but um, I worked very entrepreneurially to um, earn money when I was in high school. What kind of work did you do? Well, one of the things that I was very interested in was music, and I played cello, I played guitar, and I was the youth group song leader, and I was the religious school song leader, and my part-time work as a volunteer was at one of the homes for children that were ill, and I would take my guitar and instruments to be with the kids, and then I taught guitar. And so during high school, I had between 10 and 20 private guitar students every week. And so they would come to the house and be dropped off and I would teach them and they would be picked up. So I used music um, and my love for that and my entrepreneurial ability to earn money when I was a teenager. When you got that money, what would that have been like in comparison to your cohorts at school? Were you going out and spending it? What was kind of your habit at that point? I didn't spend a lot, but I think, you know, I would buy, you know, certain clothes that I wanted that weren't kind of part of the normal clothing that my mom would um, say was kind of appropriate or what she was willing to spend. I put money away. Um, I bought music. Um, you know, music was always something, you know, you know, I put money saving toward a better guitar. So partly there was spending and partly there was saving, but it also gave me um, a sense of positive confidence that I was able to earn money for myself. What kind of music were you playing? Folk, folk song. Give me a few examples of some of your favorite artists. Judy Collins, James Taylor, folky songs. And then I would start to learn whatever was kind of popular on the radio at the time. Uh, also kind of traditional camp songs, you know, Rise and Shine and the kind of Kumbaya, things that you'd sing around a campfire, things that you'd have a youth group singing and, and holding hands and moving together. Um, I always really enjoyed that connectivity of people together and getting all the young people singing and enjoying each other. And music really brings people together. I was an exchange student for a summer in France, and I took my guitar, and it brought people together, and I remember sitting on the train and playing the guitar, and people would be singing uh, Aux Champs-Élysées and French songs and American songs and This Land is Your Land, all those things that uh, kind of bridge international feelings. 
You're speaking my language right there. James Taylor, I grew up listening to him and a number of others from that same era. My siblings listened to so much different music, and it had a very powerful influence for good in my life. Do you feel like it still plays that same role it does in your life right now? Well, our two boys were both uh, very interested in music, and we had a lot of music going on in our house as they were growing up. And my husband and I go to lots of concerts, and we really like to do things with music, uh, just the two of us or with friends. We do a lot with music. That's great. I noticed that of the awards that you have received, do you have one that is called the Mothering That Works Award? And I just have to learn more about that. What is that about? There was a magazine called Working Mother, and uh, people got nominated. And one of my colleagues at Nestle Purina nominated me for the Mothering That Works Award. And I was selected with several others around the country, and they presented the awards in New York City. And my mom and my husband and my two sons that were pretty young, they were probably 10 and 12, they all came to New York with me and there was an award ceremony. And it was very meaningful as a working mother to have that recognition from um, the community and my employer and my family. Do you ever find that daunting when you, in front of your two sons, you're receiving an award that says mothering that works and you kind of think like, uh, am I the perfect mom? Is there anything intimidating about getting that type of an award? At that point, they were younger and they weren't really in those challenging years. Wow. I think it's teenage years is the years that parents seem to not be able to do anything right. Uh, when they're younger, you still are kind of admired by them. But the, they weren't yet in the teenage years where they couldn't understand uh, some of the things that I valued that they maybe didn't value so much. So I think it wasn't so um, challenging to receive it at the ages they were, but it might have been more challenging in those trickier teenage years. If they had kind of like held it over your head, like, Ma, I thought you were a good mom. You got this award. You better give me this whatever, this widget that I want, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine that that would be intimidating, but that's great that you received that. Uh, what was that adjustment like when you decided, I'm going to be a parent, I'm going to be working? I'm sure that you brought some of the pain of having lost your father with you. How did you make that adjustment to being a parent? Well, I do think as a working mom, having a mother who worked and a mother-in-law that worked was a huge advantage. Some of my colleagues, women that were working, if they had mothers who hadn't worked or mothers-in-law, uh, a mother-in-law who had never worked outside the home, sometimes the mother or the mother-in-law who'd never worked outside the home didn't always understand how challenging it could be to be in the workforce and to be a wife and to be a mother. Whereas in my case, I had both a mother and a mother-in-law who had experienced it. And so when I had bumps in the road and things were tiring or difficult or, you know, we were going to have pizza for the second or third night in a row because that was really all that I could kind of manage because I hadn't thought ahead enough. My mother and mother-in-law were very understanding about those things. And so I didn't have expectations from uh, my husband or my mom or my mother-in-law that were difficult. They were all supportive. And I think that was a great asset for me because I saw how my mom and my mother-in-law had risen to the occasion in their lives and been workers, been mothers. And I figure if they did it, then I would find a good way to do it. In spite of the fact that I also had a wonderful husband who had a good job and he's a great dad and a great husband and was also very helpful as he could. But he also worked even longer hours than I did. So he wasn't always as available during the week to do some of the things that I was doing as a working mom. What kind of work did he do? He is a physician. And so with patients and uh, after hours trying to do all the patient records and the demands of, of being a doctor, uh, he really was often there longer even than I was. And I could bring work home, but he couldn't really bring patients home. And together you managed this family. You were able to teach your sons and to, you know, to, do well. Uh, what have been some of the greatest blessings that you've enjoyed in bringing up these two boys? Well, they were healthy and questioning and fun and funny. One was um, a stronger student than the other. Um, both of them are very outgoing and athletic and sociable. So we had good fortune. And they also, um, you know, have been very kind to us and to their friends and good learners. So we, we tried to teach them good messages about uh, how important being kind of a well-balanced person is to be working hard, but the important role of family, the important role of friends, 
the important role of community and how you manage those different roles to have a well-balanced life. How active was your strategy to teach your sons about the professional world and how money works, how business works? It was very, I was very um, interested to show them about how money and the business world works. And I also wasn't sure whether our sons would have a natural or a personal interest more in science and medicine like their dad or like the business world like I did. My husband also had been the treasurer when he was in high school. He was the treasurer of his class. So he's also a doctor who's good at math and good at numbers and likes business. So many doctors don't like business, but my husband does. So both of us are very business interest. We both like the stock market. We both like investing. We both like to talk about kind of economic issues. And so um, our boys ended up both being interested in business and neither was interested in medicine. Is it important to have those conversations in front of your children? Well, we did not talk about our personal finances, but we talked a lot about issues that involve the decisions that we would make or things that would happen with a company in town or things that we were thinking about investing in or the fact that we actually had investments and talking about savings, talking about investing, talking about charity, talking about things that matter to the financial well-being of how would we put money away. So there was kind of a discussion that if we were talking about things to save for, we the boys knew that we had savings accounts to save for travel, to save for college, to save for retirement for us sometime in the future. And so when we were thinking about those things ourselves, we would talk to the boys about what was savings all about and why do you do it and how do you do it? Or when we were thinking about general investment, we would talk to them about investments or when we would talk about entrepreneurship and St. Louis being an entrepreneurial community, uh, we would have discussions and there were very specific things I did with our boys to get them interested in some of these topics. What were some of those things? I got books out about children and teens on starting businesses and our older son started a computer tutoring business when he was in high school to earn extra money. We had allowances for our boys, but one of the things was I believe that it's good to um, have young people put some of their own money on the table if they want something in addition to money that we give them. So often if they wanted something, we would put in a certain amount of money, but they would have to use money that they had earned either from jobs or from birthdays or from savings and that they would have to put money in if they wanted something that was maybe a higher quality of sneaker or a higher quality of a jacket of a brand name that I was not thinking was something that we were going to pay for, things like that, that I would say, you know, I'll put this much toward it, but you need to put that much toward it. And um, they kind of understood then that, um, you know, there's a, everything is not a need. There are things that are needs and then there are wants. And we would talk about what's a need and what's a want. If I understand you right, would your philo- could I fairly summarize your philosophy as being, we will provide your needs. What you want beyond that, we will help you work towards that, or we expect you to work towards that. Yes, I would agree. And they did get an allowance, and we did have opportunities for them to earn additional money with other chores, um, but that didn't change their basic allowance, but they could earn money by doing other chores. And uh, that was something that we carried through that on their summer jobs as well, when they had jobs that either paid or if they had volunteer jobs, uh, we would sometimes match some of the money that they earned and for them to understand that when you earn money, more money comes with it. I like the matching idea. It kind of makes me think of a 401k. There were two concepts that I think like a 401k. One, we wanted to teach them about putting money away and earning interest. And so we had a 10% return on money, monthly 10% return on money they put in this family bank. And they had a little account. And then they could earn interest on the money they put in the family bank. And actually, one of my sons told me recently that he wished he could get 10% a month on his money right now. I was but, thinking that exact same thing. I was yeah. like, 10%? <laughs> but, but starting with very small amounts, and I wanted it to be yeah. drastic, that they could see that when you put money away, that this thing called interest would be earned, um, and then it would then be advantageous to put money away and get interest. We also taught them about the value of compounding, compound interest. And the boys in the beginning thought that was very hard to understand 
that money would grow on top of itself. So we would explain that money would grow. And if you put it away, it would turn into more so that if you tried to invest later, you would have to put so much more in versus if you started early. And that was something that our sons now told us really made an impact on them when they learned that early, that um, that registered. And they have used that now as they are working and married, and they have convinced their spouses they need to put money away to grow toward the future. That's excellent. I think that that's a wonderful lesson for kids to be learning, and as early, as you said, as early as possible. About a year ago, you and I were talking, and you mentioned that you had very specific advice that you give to parents who are raising their children ways to teach their kids about money. I'm wondering if you have any recollections about that or that you'd like to share. One of the um, examples is that when we would go on vacation as a family, one night was always finance night. And the boys would tease about it. And this, they would. This is on vacation. One, yeah. After dinner, <laughs> on vacation, after dinner, one night during vacation, they always knew we would have a financial topic. And so we would be sitting around after dinner and maybe there'd be a fire and then they would say, mom, what's the topic this year? And so I would always have a topic that I would have thought about that I, that really needed some kind of quality time to discuss. And it could be about investing or about philosophies of saving versus spending or why we didn't borrow money, but we saved money and every year. And so they would tease about it. Um, they kind of hated it, but then they always knew it was coming, and then they would ask and kind of needle me about it, like, what night is going to be finance night? What are we going to learn this year? When can I and, really let loose, Mom? I just right. need to know. <laughs> but so, you know, it was probably one hour after dinner, one night, each vacation, and now they look back on that and they tell me that that was really very meaningful, even though they kind of hated it at the time and teased me that that was something that they – um it was kind of a family tradition, and they knew that I would tell them something important that was going to kind of help them in their lives. The other thing um, had to do with when they were um, starting to um, have money when they were in college and getting apartments is that um, I really believed in not making it too easy for them and not giving them everything. And so I would give them some of the money they needed, but not all of the money they needed. And so they would have to prioritize from the money that we would give them what would they spend and how would they spend it and what were their choices? And I think sometimes parents can do too much for their kids and give them too many things and the kids just expect it or feel entitled. And if you give them not enough where they have to choose between, you know, something that's better versus something that's not so good, but they can't get as many things, they can't buy as many clothes, they can buy one good thing, but maybe two things that are not so good, they just can't have everything. And I think some parents who have the means, or even if they don't want to be generous to their children, to, for their children to like them, they give them too much versus giving them less and letting them make some hard choices. That's a very good point. When you think about the temptation to always want your kids to like you, and yet you had these experiences on vacation when you would take the time, it was it was expected. They knew it was coming to explain some aspect of finance for a good a good amount of time. So there is that balance there, you would say. And I use finance in, in the broad sense of the word. In, in yes. charity, uh, what, what do you do with money that is for the community? And how do you spend money on yourself? How do you earn money? But then how do you make the community better? And how do you use money in good ways? Um, because really often as a giver, there's so much pleasure that you get from being a giver. Um, in knowing that you're making a difference and how do you do that as well. And so I mean, it wasn't only about making money that we talked about, or, but it was also how do you use money to have a good quality life. I agree. I think that that's a very positive message. Now, speaking of, of giving and of finding ways to contribute to society, make it a better place, outside of the Mosaic Project, because I know that that's a big passion of yours, do you have another pet cause, something that, not literally pet cause, I know you used to work for Purina, but you know, no pun intended or anything like that, but do you have another cause that is near and dear to your heart that you are very grateful to be able to contribute to? The St. Louis Crisis Nursery is an organization that has really been 
near and dear to my heart. Uh, I was on the board and then the advisory board, but it's a place where children from birth through age 12 can go for up to five days when their family is in a crisis. And that could be a sexual abuse situation. It could be a fire. It could be a parent that has to go to the hospital. And there are several locations. And when there's an emergency or trauma, the kids can be in a safe place. It's something that I have really believed in, and I have been a continual supporter of it with time and money through the years, because in good times or bad, families can go through rough times. And I really felt that it's so important that there be a safe place for children to go when the families have a crisis. Do you feel like having that type of a cause in your heart has helped motivate you to work more diligently to be able to make giving possible? I do. And often for me, for a birthday or a holiday, our sons will make a donation to that or other charities in my name uh, because they know that that's a gift that gives me pleasure more than giving me a, a physical gift. And so part of that learning has been that giving money to a charity is actually, you know, a real pleasure and gives me pride, both whether I'm a donor, but also if somebody else like my sons or my husband donate to a charity such as the St. Louis Crisis Nursery or the International Institute that takes care of refugees, that when they're vulnerable populations, that for me, a donation to them in my name for a a birthday or a holiday is very meaningful, and they've always uh, enjoyed doing that. For other people who want to get more involved in that type of a cause, what would be your advice? I think it's looking at the interest that a person has. You know, if someone really loves nature, then there are many groups that that really, you know, we need environmental issues and nature is so important. Or if they love pets, there are great causes for the pet industry. And if you love children or if you have a scientific interest or there's an illness in one's family, all these things that touch you give you a great reason to want to give back to the community. But I think also we we have to sometimes give directly to people. And it could be a family member. It could be people that you are friends with or people you know in the community that are going through a hard time. And and our children saw that we would very quietly often give gift cards or money through our religious organization for a drive in the holidays or through the 100 neediest cases or even individually if we heard of a situation that we would kind of quietly give gift cards or money or do what we needed to do, never expecting to be paid back, but just giving because we could. If it was a small amount or a larger amount, the boys both learned that. I have heard them talk about it, and I know that now in their own lives, they have also done that quietly on occasion where they have helped others in need by helping someone going through a bumpy time with both time or money or whatever it takes. And they they saw us do that, and I think they internalized that. So it is possible to both raise your children to understand and respect money, but at the same time to instill in them other values to balance that out. So it's not this, uh, you know, materialistic urge. No. And they know that, you know, we value the time that we fly to be together. The things that we often invest in are really experiences, not so much possessions. And that really our lives are about the experiences with our family, with our friends, or the broader community. Uh, but we are not that big on things. I mean, we have a good number of things, but We're not that interested in talking about things or buying extra things or having an abundance more than we need. Um, But we would really rather talk about could be restaurant experiences that we share or an event that we share or an experience we share. You know, for special birthdays, usually we end up being together as a family and that is something meaningful. Well, I think it's great that you set that type of an example for your kids. You give them those values. I really appreciate your time talking about this. Thank you so much, Betsy. It is great to see you. Great to talk to you. Thanks, George. And um, I look forward to learning from other parents um, and other experts that you talk to and see some other ideas that I can learn and uh, employ both with my kids. And now that I have two young grandchildren, um, I'm sure there are going to be some good ideas that I can gain from some of the others. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Everybody else, thank you for listening. We hoped you enjoyed the interview and found useful ideas about things you can do with your kids. Be sure to check the show notes at www.choosethenickel.com for links to names, books, and other resources we discussed in today's show. 
Also, please subscribe to our newsletter and visit our contact page where you can give us feedback. We invite you to share Choose the Nickel with your friends and join us in our quest to give kids financial freedom.